right, so we have a delegation ready to address council. Mr. Jean-Claude Haran, if you'd please step up to the mic and uh, make us your make a presentation to council with regard to uh, the Francophone Association of Eastern Ontario Private Woodlot Owners. It's always a pleasure to see you. It's always also a pleasure to s for me to see you. I know most of you around the town council table, and some of you even went to school with my young daughter. I'm not from Clarence Creek. I'm from Plantagenet, but I still have some uh, close links to Clarence Creek. I have a daughter that doesn't live too far from here, and I'm very happy for having you invited me here tonight. Now, the reason that I decided to show up before council this year to talk to you about our endeavors that we're celebrating our 20th anniversary of uh, 20 years ago, of course, we suffered through the major ice storm. We had a small, a, s a small taste of it yesterday, but nothing comparable to what happened uh, 20 years ago. Now, the idea of offering French services uh, to uh, woodlot owners uh, did exist, but the uh, storm accelerated the process. We received money from the province, so it always helps out when we receive uh, money from the province. And our association was created to offer Frank. French uh, services, and then there was no money left, and uh, services decreased, and then increased uh, uh, later on, and we're about 200, uh, 220 members that all paid their membership fees, or nearly all paid their membership fees. Those who haven't paid their membership fees uh, will have problems with uh, my, me and my friends. This is a map that uh, shows where my, our members are, where they live. You see it, I can't, but we have a lot of members, uh, both in Alfred Plantagenet and Clarence Rockland. Clarence and Rockland, of course, takes into account the municipality of Clarence and Rockland. This is where most of our members reside. I don't know the percentage of our members that reside in Clarence Rockland, but there are some in Ottawa, in Vaudreuil, in Montreal, but the majority are here. And there aren't all that many in Hawkesbury East because uh, Mayor Kirby is... Uh, hard at work clear-cutting the areas there. Well, our first uh, president uh, hailed from Chutablondo. He hadn't recruited all that many because we lost them all throughout the years. This being said, well, our activities, as you know, as many of you know, we host uh, workshops to help out woodlot owners and to manage their uh, woodlots in a sustainable way. We believe in sustainability. I should have prefaced my comments by saying that we uh, host events for our members and also for the community at large because we believe that uh, forests are quite important to, to ensure societal sustainability. And for those who are not aware, my hair is um, synonymous of what I think about what our forest cover should be. We're not talking here about clear-cutting then. No, we just take a look at Michel Boucher's head to think about clear-cutting. So we took part in activities uh, that were held in uh, schools in our area, and we also take part in the uh, child health program that hails from Plantagenet, as well as Bourgette. Uh, from Bourgette, uh, we even uh, hosted uh, tree planting events. Uh, and for the past two or three years, I emphasize even more, well, not only the planting aspect of what we do, but uh, someone's uh, undertaking to take active part in what we do now. During the course of the month of May, of course, everyone knows it's planting time, then we leave trees to do what they need to do. But you know, it's not sufficient to say that we'll plant a tree. We have to make sure also that it uh, progresses and matures. And that's an important message to impart to our children. When we take a decision, we follow up on its consequences. We, from an educational standpoint, that seems an important component of what we do. We're also in working in partnership with the Tucker House, we're fairly a we were fairly active in developing the wooded areas uh, with regards to the Tucker House, and I hope to announce that the FSC certification of the Tucker House will be acquired. The Forest uh, Stewardship Council stamp of approval will be given to the Tucker House. 
and fibers uh, with regard to the trees that are planted there are part and parcel of the sustainability philosophy that our government adopts. I would also like to thank the elected officials as well as the Clarence and Ronklin staff that allows us to make use of your community halls. That's greatly appreciated. You know, all that we do is uh, is volunteer work. We have a running working budget of approximately $15,000. If you were to do the same thing at City Hall, you wouldn't have to increase taxes, but all you need is a lot of volunteers pitching in. <laughs> this being said, this being said, Mr. Mayor, there's one thing that really took me by surprise, and it's this, is that we don't we don't show off to advantage our forest cover. We have public woodlots, for example. We do have public woodlots that are that you own. I spoke to one of the town council, one of the town council members that didn't seem to be aware of those woodlots that you own. So it seems that your the woodlot phenomena is not all that well known within the city council. And I would like those woodlots or those wooded areas to be shown off to advantage. So we'd like to work hand in hand with your uh, advisory committee with regard to heritage matters. Uh, our woodlots are part and parcel of our heritage. To have a better idea of what we have to work with in Clarence and Rockland from a woodlot standpoint, from a park standpoint. And if an inventory was made of all of those existing woodlots. For example, we've taken part in the wood and forest exhibition that was hosted by Riceville. If Clarence and Rockland was to hold a similar fair and enhance what you have from a heritage standpoint with regard to woodlot areas, it would be a good thing. I think we're interested in working also or to make suggestions to enhance your library resources to uh, promote the placing of uh, woodlot related books on your public library bookshelves. And we'd also be interested in taking part in a citizen driven project to develop a given woodlot somewhere here. I picture the citizen project as a project that would encourage local participation, citizenry participation. For example, so it would be an idea to enhance or to show off to advantage our existing woodlot areas. We could start off modestly. I'm not asking you to increase taxes to 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 uh, uh, create a budget for this, well, I'd be, I'm very pleased to hear that because you'd be disappointed. No, no, I'm not, I don't have any illusions as to this, Mr. Mayor. But I'd like to discuss details with regards to this with the subcommittee that's already in place to see if it's a doable thing or not. If you have any questions, folks, I'm here to answer them. Councillor Lalonde, just a comment, uh, Mr. Mayor. I know that the South Nation Conservation Authority gave us a presentation, I believe it was last fall, just prior to budget time, and one of the things that stems from the report they gave us was that the forestry cover in Prescott Russell reduces drastically each and every year. And if, uh, if uh, we have they stated that an adequate forestry cover or forest cover would be in between 30 and 40 percent. But we're in b below the 30 percent mark, approximately 26 to 27 percent. I believe maybe 24, 22 percent. If you take a look at last year's data or even this year's data, it's decreasing exponentially. Mr. The mayor also mentioned that uh, communities to the east and to the south have difficulty. Well, the, in southern Ontario, there are some places that only have 2% uh, 
worth of uh, forestry cover, of course, around Toronto area. South Nation Authority will plant trees and will guarantee that these trees thrive for the next five years once they've planted trees. You know, they might plant uh, two to three foot high trees in individual areas. I believe these projects, Mr. Mayor, are should be looked upon as being priority projects. I believe Mario had called for reform, reform measures to be applied to the environmental committees, and that might be incorporated in all of this, along with the uh, Eastern Ontario private woodlot owners. Well, let me comment the South Nation uh, Conservation Authority report that called upon the data that was called in between 2014 and 2018. I extrapolated the loss incurred in between 2008 and 2014. And if we follow along, it means that as of 2040, we won't have any forests, existing forests left. That's what the trend shows. The county was the sole body that could uh, that could decide upon clear-cutting measures. Alfred Dunplanchen said no to this. Well, you see, the problem lies in this, Mr. Mayor. Agriculture is a sacred cow. We're all in need of food. And lots that houses are built on are also sacred, but the only thing that's not sacred is though are those lots in between the two. You know, we tolerate tree, trees until we have, you know, practical use of this particular lot. So what I'm saying is this, and this is going to be my conclusion. I need food. I need a home. But if I don't have drinking water and if I don't have breathable air, in a very short time from now, we won't need any food, nor will we need any housing. We'll all be dead. She said, well, that's it. Thank you very much, Mr. Adar. Okay, so we kept um, the star for next. <laughs> yes. Please bear with us, folks, as we set up. You know, you can't set foot on forestry areas, really. Yes. Testing, testing. testing. If I yell into this, does the person in the truck go crazy. Testing. All you need is to ask South Nation Conservation Authority to step in. That's all we need to do. Cheyenne, the uh, lady who's in charge of this. That's it. Oh, very good. <laughs> all in favor? <laughs> <laughs> Even Mr. Keogh's great. <laughs> That's not a surprise. That's not a surprise. Go uh, for it, Mr. Wilson. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm, I'm honored to have a couple minutes of your time tonight. Uh, I was asked to make a presentation on smoke alarms and carbon monoxide alarms to city staff at the CEO's lunch a couple weeks ago. Uh, and I think it was fairly well received. It's, I mean, it's timely for us, given a recent fire death in our municipality, to try and stress the importance and make sure that everyone understands what the requirements are for smoke and carbon monoxide alarms in their home. And so we became aware that there were a number of our own city staff that were not aware of the requirements. So that's sort of what drove this presentation. And hopefully by continuing to spread that message and answer questions as they come up, uh, yourselves as elected officials and certainly the voice of our municipality can help spread that knowledge. And, and by all means, we're always happy to answer questions if people want to call us and ask for clarification. We'd Especially since we had a death and uh, fire not long ago, I think it's important to bring back what you said. Sorry. I guess I wasn't listening. <laughs> it's always important to reinforce it's that it's important, important you know. So I appreciate Mr. Mayor backing me up on that and driving the point. So that's that's great. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. So as you're probably aware, under provincial law in Ontario, you have to have smoke alarms on every level of your home and outside all sleeping areas. The challenge that we face in our municipality today is that many of us bought homes prior to that law coming into place. You don't, 
you're not grandfathered in because you have an older home. So this is one of the few laws that says you still have to comply today. The home that I'm currently renting did not have smoke alarms in the basement when I moved in. And it's the owner's responsibility to make sure smoke alarms are there. So at the end of the day, you have to have a smoke alarm on every level of your home. If you have sleeping areas in different wings or areas of your home, you have to have smoke alarms outside each of those sleeping areas. So it's potential that you have more than one smoke alarm on a level of your home. Sorry? Do you know? Just, to, just so we know which houses are more than likely affected. Oh, I think it was before that. Smoke alarms on every level? I think it was before... Yeah, that was before CO. That's going back a while. Um, I'm going to say early 2000s, but okay. I'd have to get you that exact date. I think that's right. Any, anyone who builds now, don't they need one in each bedroom? Correct. I, okay, yeah. thank you. Under building code. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. So that's, that's where that comes from. This is a picture. I'm, I'm a firefighter. Sometimes I need pictures. It's easier than words. So again, as you can see on this picture, there's a smoke alarm, which is this little black box on each level of the home. And this one's compliant because the smoke alarm on the second floor is adjacent to the sleeping rooms. So that's good. If you had sleeping rooms on the first floor or somewhere far away, you'd have to have multiple smoke alarms. So it's important that everyone understand that that's a requirement. You can't tamper with them. So they have to be put in. It's the owner's requirement to put them in. Anyone who disables a smoke alarm, you can't disable them. You can't take the batteries out. Um, and you, they need to be replaced like anything uh, that ages over time. The sensors in those smoke alarms degrade over time. It's important that people understand you have to replace them. This is some of the cheapest insurance you'll have in your life in your home. The reality is the way we build houses today, and I'm in the process of building a new house, you have roughly three minutes to get out of that house if you have a house fire. And there's not a fire department on this planet that can be at your house in three minutes. It's just not possible. So the reality is you have to look after your family, you have to look after your loved ones, and you have to make sure that you can get them out in, a, in time. And the only way you can do that is if you know that the fire is there, which means you need to know soon. So it's important. You can't, and I mentioned this on the last slide, you can't, what we're finding in some houses is people are uh, getting to the point where their old hardwired smoke alarm that's now 10, 11 years old starts chirping at them and saying it's time to replace me. And when you go to the hardware store, your favorite hardware store, it's less expensive to buy a battery operated smoke alarm. So people are buying a battery operated smoke alarm to replace a hardwired smoke alarm. That's a reduced level of protection. The risk is that the battery dies in the smoke alarm and you have no protection. So it is against the law in Ontario to reduce the level of protection of any smoke alarm in your home. And that's sort of the picture that I have uh, on here is the hardwired smoke alarm on the left <coughs> being replaced with a battery operated smoke alarm on the right. That's against the law in Ontario. Uh, in terms of carbon monoxide alarms, I, I mean it was a month ago tomorrow. A month ago tomorrow, a young child, an infant, passed away in Barrie, Ontario because there were no functioning carbon monoxide alarms in the home. Uh, a few years ago, provincial law was modified to require you to have a carbon monoxide alarm in your home if you have any, any, basically anything that burns. So if you have a natural gas furnace, if you have a gas fireplace, if you have a wood stove, if you have a pellet stove, if you smoke a lot of dope. I, I mean, whatever it is, if you're burning something in your home, you're required to have a CO alarm in your home, okay? Uh, and if you don't have any of those things, if you're all electric but have an attached garage, we know that cars can produce carbon monoxide, therefore you have to have a CO alarm in your home. The requirement by law in Ontario today, the minimum requirement by law is that you have one carbon monoxide alarm, at least one in your home, adjacent to or outside of your sleeping areas. So that's wherever your sleeping areas are. Again, if you've got sleeping areas in different areas of your home, you're required to have multiple CO alarms outside of the sleeping areas of your home. Buy a new house, you should have a carbon monoxide alarm in your home. 
Again, it's been a code requirement for a number of years, so you should have one in a new home today. The reality is like anything, they age. And if you don't take care of it, it, it may not function when you need it. And the problem with carbon monoxide is we can't smell it, we can't taste it, we can't see it. And the biggest risk is it makes you drowsy. Well, I'm drowsy right now. So the end risk is I go home and I fall asleep and I don't think anything about it and I don't wake up in the morning. And so it's, it's critically important that our residents, particularly our residents, but really everyone, understand the importance of having a carbon. If there's a potential source of carbon monoxide in your home, you need to have some way of knowing about it so that you can actually do something about it. Um, just a quick question for the CEO. Uh, some of them come plugged into walls. Some are the ones that are actually battery operated. Just a quick question, does it matter? Uh, not under law. So under provincial law, it doesn't matter what style. I've got a slide on that coming up. What about the Wilson law? Next. Uh, okay, okay, so the Brian Wilson preference is you always want to have redundancy in your system. So I would always suggest that you have a hardwired carbon monoxide alarm that also has battery backup. So right now, there's no power in my house. I've been without power for a couple of days. All of my hardwired smoke alarms are not getting any power from the electrical grid. If there's no battery backup, I'd have no protection in my home. So by having both, I'm protected. Does that make sense? So again, the graphic here shows the minimum requirement. Anyone on council? Here you go, council. This is your test to see if you're still awake because we're, we're pushing late into the evening. Is carbon monoxide lighter than air or heavier than air? Or is it close to the same specific I'm going to have a chance for that Heavier. So the reality is it's very, very close to the same specific gravity or vapor density as air. <coughs> so it, because it's got a similar vapor density to air, uh, if you walk through this room, you're going to stir it up and it's going to mix with air. So when we first came out with carbon monoxide alarms, there was discussion about where those should be placed. Should they be high? Should they be low? Because it's so close to normal air, the suggestion is you just need to have one. Because most of us have a forced air furnace, it's going to move the air around in our home anyway. As a result, it's going to be mixed in with the air. So as long as you've got one in your home, you'll have some level of protection. The best answer would be to have a CO alarm on every level of your home, which is what I have. So every level of my home has a carbon monoxide alarm on it, because that way it doesn't matter where you are in the home, if, you, if there's carbon monoxide there, you're going to hear it, and you'll be able to do something about it. You have combo units too, right? You do have combo units. And I think the, I mean, the point that I made to city staff is, each one of us, most of us drive a car, we all pay for insurance on that car, we all probably complain that that insurance is, is too expensive. A combination smoke alarm costs $50. So $59, $60 for combination carbon monoxide and smoke alarm. They're good for 10 years. That means the cost, the cost for that combination alarm is $6 a year. For $6 a year, you can protect your family and your loved ones. That is some of the cheapest insurance out there that will ever exist on this planet. $6 a year for a combination alarm that will look after your family and your loved ones. So it, it is shocking to me when you look at statistically in Clarence Rockland, 50%, 5-0% of our homes are non-compliant with provincial law today. 50%. We've got roughly 10,000 homes in our municipality. That means 5,000 of these residences do not meet these requirements. And there's people at risk in our municipality today for $6 a year. So it, it's on us, That's and, and we're going to talk about it. But these are the CO alarms that you were talking about, Councillor. So there are options. You can get a plug-in version. You can get the battery or a hardwired carbon monoxide alarm and you can get a combination hardwired with battery backup. That's what I have installed in my house. When, when you do your uh, home uh, visits, uh, is the problem more, uh, do you see a problem more with uh, old units not being replaced or non-functional or just plain old missing uh, 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 detectors? Both. Both, really? So the, the problem that we find today is people bought their homes 15 years ago so, show of hands from council, and I did this with city staff, so don't be shy. How many of you expect you'll have a fire in your home? That's the problem. So the problem is, I, I can stand in any room, in, in front of any group of people, and ask people to put up their hands if they think they're going to have a fire that's going to require the fire department to come to their home. And no one put up their hands. We were in front of a room of 100 people-ish. Not a single person put up their hands to say that they thought they'd have a fire. 
Well, statistically, I can tell you the average person, every one of us in here, will have five fires in your home in your lifetime. Most of them are, not, are small. They're not reportable, right? So I was cooking something on the stove, and it caught fire, and I put the lid on it, and I dealt with it, and I never called the fire department. One in four of us, you've got seven members of council here tonight. There is a good chance the two of you, at some point in your life, will have a fire that will require a response from the fire department. That's just statistics. It's only one that I have to do that one. And I don't, and I don't cook, so. <laughs> but the, the reality is that one in four people will end up calling a fire department for a fire in their home that's too big for them to handle. One in four. Yet when I stand in front of a room of 100 people, not a single person raises their hand. And because of that, that's why people don't put the priority in replacing their smoke alarms or their carbon monoxide alarms, because we all believe it's not going to happen to us. It's the simplest mistake out there. I know, I know of people in the firefighting profession, firefighters that have had fires in their home. I know of fire stations that have had fires. Accidents happen. Accidents happen all the time. We do our best to try and prevent them. The biggest thing you can do to look after your own families and your own loved ones is to make sure that you have a way to alert them so that they can get out and that they don't become a victim to a fire or a CO related incident. And it's cheap. We, I mean, $6 a year for a combination smoke and carbon monoxide alarm is incredibly cheap. That's a couple, cup of, couple cups of coffee a year to protect your family. That's incredibly cheap. Oh, now I've got a warning message here. Rob, can you uh, make yourself useful? I'll be giving you <laughs> Mr. Wilson. I know, it's a bit of a stretch. Mr. Wilson, I'm going to be giving you a warning sign too soon. All good. We're almost done, Mr. Mayor. So uh, we talked about this. It's the same with smoke alarms. Owners have to install them. They have to be maintained. They have to be replaced. No one can disable or tamper with them. Under the provincial law today, fire inspectors can issue tickets for this. So any chief officer in the fire department can show up today and write you a ticket. If you don't have a smoke alarm on where they're required, that's a, that's a ticketable offense, just like a speeding ticket. You can receive a ticket from the fire department today. Uh, if you don't have a, if you take the battery out of your smoke alarm because you've got a loved one or maybe yourselves that cook and often test your smoke alarm by creating actual smoke, and you take the battery out because it's annoying you, that's a ticketable offense. So we, we can write tickets for those things today, and the reason that those are ticketable offenses is to try and drive the importance because so many people aren't doing it. So there's a number of infractions that we can deal with, including basically anything to do with tampering, removing, not installing, failure to maintain. Not notifying your landlord, so if you're a tenant and you don't tell the landlord that my smoke alarm's not working, that's a ticketable offense. It's all there. Those tickets range anywhere from $235 to $360 on the spot per infraction. So if you're missing multiple smoke alarms or you've got old smoke alarms in your home, you can get a ticket for each one. That's, that's a significant hit to the pocketbook. Far more expensive than the $6 a year it'll cost you to get a new one. The biggest risk, sorry, the biggest risk is, I guess, as, a, as an enforcement person, if we don't have a set ticket for that, we can give you a summons, a Part 3 summons. And under the Fire Protection and Prevention Act, that's punishable by a fine of up to $50,000 in a year in jail. That's a, that's a pretty hefty cost for most of us as compared to putting a working smoke alarm in your home. When, when you do your home-to-home -home visits again, uh, do you actually fine people or you, would you focus more on the education part because I know your department also provides to the homeowner uh, um, you, you have your own uh, uh, devices that you can sell to the residents so I'm guessing you do a little bit of both enforcement and if you see if something that's major to our, our goal is to gain compliance through education I think you know, I mean it's these sessions here if I can come and tell you the importance of this and it's really not that expensive I think most people want to comply I think most people want to have their homes be safe and at the end of the day that's our goal so when we go and do our home smoke alarm program, I have a slide on that, it's the next slide, but we talk about the fact that we want to encourage compliance through education, tell you why it's important, tell you how you can comply and help you get there. We do carry some smoke and CO alarms that the city purchases and sells to residents at cost, so it's just a cost recovery program to help people comply. Uh, and ultimately, I mean, enforcement's our last option. If we, if we can't gain compliance or someone refuses to let us into the property and we end up there for something and then find out that you're non-compliant, you're gonna face a fine. You're gonna get a ticket or a summons. Because we, uh, at the end of the day, my concern is that we don't have any more fire deaths in our municipality and that we make sure we're as safe as we can be. We'll never get rid of fire, 
we continue to deal with it every day. We burn, th you know, we burn candles, we have fireplaces, we do all those things. Accidents will happen. We just need to make sure that our people are safe. And that's really what you got me here for. That's why you hire a fire chief, is to look after those residents and make sure people are as safe as they possibly can be. And so that's our goal. So this is our, we talked about this plan, and uh, if we've got 10,000 homes in our municipality, to get to them every 10 years so that we can catch them when their smoke alarms are expiring, that means we need to do 1,000 homes a year. Council's passed that as part of our fire prevention policy. That's why it's important that council continue to make that investment, understanding there is a cost to that, for us to go door to door to 1,000 homes a year and walk through each person's house and make sure that they have functioning alarms with them cost money but at the end of the day we're here to make sure that people are safe and that we can continue to enjoy a safe and wonderful place to live and play and grow and uh, and these are simple things to help make sure we get there uh, as always if anyone has complaints or requests inspections they can call the fire department we're obligated by law to follow up on those so if, if anyone's aware if you your kids go to a play date at a friend's place and they may not be compliant they can call the fire department and we're more than happy to follow up on that and make sure that they are compliant Question. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Perfect. You did a good job. Question. 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 It's very, very important because it's very sad that in 2018 that we lost a rate payer because they did not have a working smoke alarm. And thank you, Mr. Wilson, for making the presentation tonight, given that you started work at 2 yesterday morning. I appreciate it. He's still good. <laughs> if you ask him for a speech, he'll go on. <laughs> thank you, Mr. The show Wilson. Must go. Okay. All right. Question period. Well, that's over and done with. Report for the United Counties of Prescott and Russell, where there's the ambulance matter that still to be settled. The President's uh, Golf Tournament uh, to be held on the Castle View Golf Course on the 15th of June. Tee off time at 10 a.m. Let's go on to staff reports. 9.1 Consulting Services Development Charges. Councillor Zant that uh, council approve a, a contract with Hampson Consulting Limited for $59,950 plus taxes for support in developing a new development charges bylaw and policies for 2020. Supported by Councillor Bellinger. Questions? Uh, I think we asked for some comparables to what other cities are doing. So I, I thought that all we meant by that is we wanted someone make some phone calls and put, maybe put a little chart together to see what other cities are charging for development charges. But this is only to make a study. But again, we I'm need sorry, to make I, a study by law. We need to make a study by law? Yes. Every five years, if, if you have development charges, you are required under the Development Charge Act to complete a study. The previous study was approved December 2015. It takes an entire year to complete the process because there's a lot of m public meetings that are required and then there's public notice periods. When you spread all that out along with the actual work that takes place, it, the process to complete the study is a year. So that's why we're here now. And the consultants that are being recommended, there's two, two companies in Ontario that they're pretty well split the business between all the municipalities in Ontario and you need their expertise interpreting the regulations from the Development Charge Act is a full-time job. So this money is to hire uh, Hemson to uh, complete the study. If I remember right, they're the ones that did the last one? Yes, they are. Okay. Okay, sir. Other questions? Mr. Mayor, I'm wondering if this is due for 2020. Yes, sir, one year into the study, we're now in 2018, it'll be completed in 2019. Well, it states December 2015 as a start point, so it's been ongoing for three years. 
we'll have to wait uh, for the new council to be sworn in in 2018 before any action is taken on this. I figure at present that we have so many projects that are ongoing. Last year, we weren't able to complete many of those projects that we had on the table, on our plate, basically, if there are approached uh, next year in the month of January next, they still have time, they have two years. If they can't go through, they can't follow through, we still have 60,000 bucks to play with that we obtain for this purpose. Yes, Councillor, or Mrs. Collier, please. Well, they need to take more time, Mr. Mayor and Councillor Lalonde, because given all of the developers involved in the community. Well, you see, the last time they were caught in a blitz situation, and it's hard to understand every th all of the components included in this study. So it's very important to maintain contact with individual individuals. So we'll continue on in French because things are going well with your French accent. Well, at present, you can't take a year dealing with a consulting firm for you. Uh, with 59,000 bucks on the table. He'll do this within uh, three months. Well, the city of Clarence and Rockland is preparing a lot of information for their needs. Now, in the month of June, the uh, council approved the contents of this report, and it's important for the consultant needs to understand what the town's intent is and all of the projects uh, that wind up uh, through a consulting process. For example, the, uh, the uh, study on public transit. Uh, so it, in this instance, it takes a year to come up with the necessary calculations and the price is spot on when they, you know, it takes time. You know, they need to, th there is also a 20-day waiting period to do something and then another 20-day period to host uh, public meetings. Well, I would have waited end of November or start of December f to deal with this next January. We still have two years to go with this. Well, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. So the, the, the project will be there, like the CEO mentioned. We want to get them on board as soon as possible. They're not going to be working, uh, for, you know, they're going to have preliminary meetings. They're going to be meeting with us to see what material we have, what material we don't have. A lot of it we don't have. So they're going to be periods where they're not working. We won't be paying them. But, the, you know, the majority of the work will, pro will happen in 2019, but some of it will happen in 2018. Otherwise, we're going to get behind in the project. And we want to make sure project, the study last time was done well, but I think it can be done better, and we want to make sure it's done better. Better means better estimates, better um, advice, etc. If, if the project is finished, in, uh, let's say, at the end of 2019, would, they, would we still be required, let's say, to make another study in 2024, 2024 or 2025, since we're, you know what I mean? The five years is a sunset. You cannot go past five years. Okay. But since uh, this last one was done in 2015, December 2015, can't we go till 2020? Uh, December 2014. No, no, no. 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 No, no, uh, 2015, it was just after you were elected. Okay, so yeah. really, we have to be done by 2020, February 2020. This is the last room. Yeah. Plus, if so the developers um, <coughs> challenge the study, that takes It could take time. longer. So that's why we're not taking a chance. We're asking to be done now yeah. so that the whole process can start because we have to be finished by the end of next so year. The development well. community wants so this. budget capital has changed. Well, this is a capital budget expenditure. Well, they haven't asked for extra money. No, last time around they didn't 
ask extra money. They just came up with a price and that's it. Well, if ever the study yields data that is a bit different than what we thought we'd have, we can go through the process much more quickly for the benefit of the community. It's important that we move along with this immediately, just in case we get delayed further along the line. All those in favor, carried then. Thank you. Now let's go on now to the list of works with regards to the uh, Leving Natural Park Development Project list of work. Mr. Levin, a quick one. The Committee of the Whole recommends that Council authorize the community services to proceed with the development uh, project with regards to the Leving Natural Park in keeping with the list of works uh, enumerated in the report LOE. Dash 0406 has recommended, um, seconded by Councillor Simard. <laughs> Councillor Lavard is still not yet with us. Uh, he was still on the other motion. Any questions? All those in favor then. Carried. Thank you. Clarence Rockland, waste disposal site tipping fees. Councillor Simard, that the Committee of the Whole recommends that Council adopt the new bylaw that proposes and man. The Clarence Rockland Waste Disposal Site Management that modifies previous uh, bylaw to abrogate uh, sections 8 and 9 and abrogate uh, section 2004-85 and that we recommend new tipping fees um, and that the Committee of the Whole recommends that the new bylaw proposed and the new user fees proposed be uh, come into effect as of the 1st of July 2018, seconded by Councillor Lalonde. Any questions? Councillor Lalonde. Well, not a question, but a comment, Mr. Mayor. Finally, I'm happy to see that we're going ahead with this. Now, the only thing is this. Uh, Mr. Le Wilson, you know, when we're always faced with changes, similar to this one here, we're going to be charging a lot more for garbage collection and so on and so forth, or disposal. There are probably some individuals that will try to dump uh, garbage in those extreme parts of uh, roadways that we won't visit all that much. We have to make sure that people don't do anything that should not be done or ought not be done. No other comments? Page 55, Mr. Mayor, up on top of the page. Proposed fee charges. The current rate. Is this the price that they're paying at present or the proposed rate? Now, this is what we're paying at present, right? Current rate is means what we're currently paying. It's not what you're proposing, is it? Well, I don't know what you're getting. You see, we proposed the prices and changes. Are you dealing with the bylaw or the report? Well, there are surcharges and fees. Current rates is what we're charging at present, right? The minimum charge, right? Yes. So, hold on now. You're dealing with the bylaw here. So, see, what we are increasing, in fact, is this, $90 per ton. Though uh, That applies to residential waste. Well, that's the current rate. Well, that's what we propose because we're dealing with a new bylaw. Well, that's my question. Yes, that, exactly. That's what's being proposed. So it should be proposed in year of current. Well, if you approve the bylaw, it will become the current rate that will come into effect, basically. This is what's proposed. We don't have the previous costs, do we, right, beside the new ones? Well, previous costs uh, are borne out in the attachment under the user fee and landfill site heading uh, that relates to the existing bylaw. And we're also dealing with volumes and cubic meters. It doesn't convert all that easily, all that well. But we came up with an approximate uh, calculation at what figures ought to be. It would be around $34 to $40 per ton. But it, we can't apply this rule all that easily because we start off with a given volume. And then we apply this to weight. For example, if there's a pickup truck uh, that's half full uh, that carries uh, light objects as opposed to heavy objects, it's hard to proceed to an exact conversation. But it would hover in between 34 to $40 per ton. So we're over and above, uh, we're up to the $90 amount. The report establishes some comparables, of course. Well, 
we can't be in the we can't situate ourselves in the cheapest uh, rates. You want to be competitive, of course. We want to keep our landfill side. Yes, of course. So, basically, uh, what we're dealing with is a reasonable proposition, as opposed to other municipalities that are run that run their particular or individual landfill sites. Well, once again, Mr. Mayor, I'm wondering. What is the actual price? It's 34, and we're raising it to 90. We can't obtain sensible prices with regards to this, and $90 per ton is approximately the figure that we pegged as being the figure that we would have uh, implemented with regards to waste put in landfill sites, and it's comparable to other municipalities. All, any questions? All those in favor, then carried. Let's go on now. Engineering Service Waste Treatment Plant, Councillor Bellinguette. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Whereas that an amount of $12.5 million for the necessary improvement of the Engineering Service Waste Treatment Plant was approved for the utilized budget for 2018, and whereas the Anderson firm was retained in 2015 to supply concept and uh, study services with regards to this uh, project um, for the amount of $505,000. The Committee of the Whole recommends that we accept to modify the amount to $898,000 for study services and concept plans, construction contract, and the implementation of all works associated with the Engineering Service Waste Treatment Plan and that we accept that the Ontario Clean Water Agency be retained to supply revision, plan revision services up to $55,000 and that the Committee of the Whole uh, stipulate that we adopt a bylaw authorizing the mayor and the town clerk to enter into a signed agreement. It seems to me that it's quite expensive, a million, because we've only hired the engineer up to now. Well, it does appear uh, expensive, but if you take into consideration the value of the contract and the project, $12.5 million, the engineering fees uh, represent 13% uh, of the total costs. Generally speaking, Mr. Mayor, we're taking a look at uh, 15 to 18% for engineering fees. So we've still come up with a reasonable price, I believe. Mr. Leonard, I've sent you an email at the beginning of the week, or the end of last week, should I say, concerning potential options that we ought to have looked into. Do you think we might? it would be advisable to incorporate uh, those in the project development as it stands right now? Uh, I'm, I don't expect a yes or no answer right now, but I see that there's a potential of exploring different avenues of action here. I don't know if we need to get into the detailed explanation. Well, it's easier for you to get into a detailed explanation than I, so I'll let you do it. Well, to make all the town councillors aware of what's going on, I received an email to determine whether we could take into consideration septic tanks, pumping of the septic fields, and to treat them in our water treatment plant or through its facilities. Now, this particular project won't be conducive to this. We're not increasing the uh, water treatment plant's capacity. Uh, we're dealing with the treatment of uh, odors emanating from the operations stemming from the water plant, or water debit, or liquid debit. Uh, and we'd have to look into this, but in further phases phases of the construction work as it is being is as it is being implemented in stages of course the this might be tantamount to significant uh, savings for those who collect uh, waste if 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 the what we have as many septic fields in the city of Clarence and Rockland as there are some sewer systems that are connected to the our sewer treatment plant 
Well, I know, but I've heard talk as to where this is being deposited right now. Well, at the city of Ottawa, not all of it, unfortunately. Councillor Lalonde, you see, the contract was awarded on the 7th of December of last year. Now, this being said, have we received a report? Well, not last year, actually, in 2015. Now, has a report been issued since then? Well, you see, what's happened? You're talking about Anderson? Yes, yes, the and yes. What happened is that they worked on plans. They worked on that part that originally uh, dealt with the initial project on until we reviewed this in 2018 and increased the scope of the works involved. Now, they came up with a preliminary plan, but to cap it off, they needed a new mandate to include other elements or other components. So the documents have not been finalized yet. That's why we're increasing the contract. Well, I'm hard pressed to accept this. We're awarding $400,000 more than the initial resolution called for. When we awarded the contract, was a, it was pegged at $498,000 and not at $525,000. I have the minutes from December 2015, and there were two other companies that were quite close, like WSP, $518,000, and Chem2M, that also met all the criteria put forward, at $508,000. And now we turn around, and they're asking additional money to complete the report. I'm hard-pressed to accept this. Well, that was in 2015, three years ago. Yes, but we don't need to go back to tenders for this. Well, Mr. Mayor, the reason that we're asking to make use of Anderson's uh, services is that this firm is already so much involved, invested in the process, that it would be too costly to deal with another firm, another company. Well, that's what you say would cost us too much. But they never, s they have, a, they have yet to submit us a report, and this has been dragging on for the past three years. Well, the pro, the the the, the project never progressed all that much. So this five hundred twenty-five thousand dollars that was agreed to, not all that much was spent on the project. I think we're too soft on on this matter. We're, we're playing it too softly. We've brought some modifications and changes granted. But have we received any report as to what has been done up to now? None? No, none. Well, I don't know. I have the, the two other companies before me, the name of the two companies that had tendered in 2015. But their mandate did not request them to come up with a report. It was to come up with plans and specifications. They've already put in work from a preliminary standpoint. Well, I don't, uh, I, uh, I don't agree with this. Well, they've already entered into consultation with town employees. Well, let us give us an updated report. They were hired at to, uh, for $498,000 and not for $525,000. It's only a $27,000 difference. Well, they're asking $400,000 more now. Yes, but that's three and a half years later. Yes, but we hired them to prepare the report. We haven't received the report, and now there are modifications that come into play, and they're asking $400,000 more. This project widened its scope, did not? Yes, initially had a value of five point some million dollars and now we're up to twelve point four million dollars. Well you see, we analyzed the project when we prepared the budget for it and you stated that there was two million dollars of additional work to be performed. Now from four point seven as a starting point and two million dollars comes up to six point seven million dollars. That amounts to six point seven million dollars, not twelve million dollars. The initial budget called for five some odd million dollars. Now, the, from budgetary standpoint, we'd come up with a report stating that we had an initial budget of five point some odd million dollars. I'm not exact as to the amount, and we needed an additional seven million dollars with regards to the equalization tech work to be performed, engineering services, additional engineering services that had been identified, approved with regards to this budget and uh, many other components and factors 
that compelled us to increase it from 5.5 million to 12 million dollars. But when we approved this project initially, we approved it at five million dollars. Well, the first five million dollars was strictly for screening purposes. Yes, screening, concrete slab, well, engineering and contingency fees. That's, it, it, these were all included. There was no reference to equalization treatment uh, fees. We're up to $7 million over and above what was initially projected to perform $2 million worth of additional work. And the equalization component is pegged at, or equalization tank that was added was pegged at three million dollars that component now don't forget that the screening process had been greatly underestimated it took all those many years to complete final work on this so the original five million dollars is not in the ballpark anymore we're up to 12 million dollars yes we are up to 12 million right now so that's why you see the same engineering firm that comes up with a five million dollar estimate and the same firm comes back with a twelve million five hundred and ninety six thousand dollar request well, we've added on to the project. How much? We've added $7 million worth of additional work to it. Well, that's not what we were told. Look, according to the price before me, what's stated here is $7 million. Well, the equalizing tank only is pegged at $2.8 million more. Well, this was added on a couple of months later, but prior to our asking for additional grants from the province. Mr. Leonard gave us figures from five to $12 million. That's why engineering fees are growing exponentially. We added, you know, repairs and other work to be done because we were resorting to screening beforehand. Mr. Darch, got involved in the report that explains all of the necessary changes that leads up to the $7 million. And so, well, uh, he has those figures. Well, I have all of the documents, but with no explanation to them. There's a contingency of $2.1 million with regard to your 12.5. So you have that type of wiggle room. Mr. Bellinget, well, is this, uh, uh, you know, regular? Uh, 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 does this is this conducive with regards to regular dealings we have with Anderson? No. Well, you see, there's eight hundred ninety-eight thousand dollars for study services, conception and direction of works, and implementation of all associated works. We're not dealing with only the concept of plans and specifications. They are project managers. They'll be charged with managing. They'll be. Uh, with managing this, yes, they're, well, RV and, no, they're not project managers. RV Anderson will come up with a design, with a concept, basically. And when this project is implemented, I don't, I don't know how to best express myself. Well, you know, when we implement the project per se, and because Aqua is a partner with us in these dealings, and they're also co-managers with regards to this project. They'll receive proper training that will make them aware of how to make proper use of this equipment, how to properly use this equipment. So we won't have to get involved in this any further. Well, Aqua, to approve this resolution, will act as a project manager also. That's, that's That explains the the additional $150,000 fee. They'll come up with a study, service, uh, study, the implementation of services, and the implementation of the contract stipulations. So municipal Council hereby awards a contract to RV Anderson Associates Limited to provide design, contract administration, and commission services in the amount of 498 plus HST for pre-screening concrete slab repair pumping station number one upgrades and 
forestry works associated with sewage treatment facilities. That's what it says. That's, those are what the original documents state. I don't see any difference. Well, during the, our, the course of our budgetary talks, we made you aware of discrepancies in this budget. There were discrepancies with regards to this budget, and there's a new equalization tank that added on to this project that added an additional $7 million to the total figure. The 4.5 of the $7 million that you're referring to was was reflective of 2014 figures. In the meantime, we came up with a lot of reports. We were issued many reports that explained the increase in additional services that needed to be implemented. Council Lalonde refers to a past report, really, in this matter that is not applicable anymore. So uh, s some additions were made to the initial project. So we're dealing with the equalization tank. Uh, there was also a 4.5 to 5 million additional figure. And of the original $5 million 2014 figure, uh, there were updates brought to the unit cost, you know, inflating it from the 5.5 2014 figure given the existing mandate at that time to the existing figure now. So the $2.8 million with regard to the equalization tank applies only to the equalization tank, but other components were added on to this as time went by. Fine. All those in favor, then. Carry, then. Thank you. Let go on now to the amendment of the zoning by the Councillor Laval. The Committee of the Whole recommends that Council approve the application to amend Zoning Bylaw 2016-10 in order to change the zoning category of the property at 2160 Laval Street from Village Mixed Use VM Zone to Village Mixed Use Exception 1 VM-1 Zone as recommended by the Planning Committee. Seconded by Councillor Simard, all those in favor, thank you then. Let's go on now to the rental of land off Leash Park. The Committee of the Whole hereby recommends the municipal council to adopt a bylaw to authorize the mayor and the city clerk to sign a, the agreement between the city of Clarence Rockland and Brigil 3223700 Canada Inc. for the rental of the land si situated at 1452 Poupard as recommended. Second by Councillor Bellinguet. Questions? How much is the rental? Zero. You, you, can't, you, you can't go any lower than that, really. Really, it's a, it, it's a gift more than anything else. But they can take back possession of this property when they wish to do so, yes. But it's, it's widely used, however. Very good. Then. All those in favor? Ah, oh, too easy. It's just too easy, Mr. Mayor. Let's go on now to the daycare budget, Councillor Ledon. Well, we did we not vote on this? Did we not? Uh, well, I move that report 2018-0407 be received for information purposes. That's with regard to the daycare budget. Seconded by Councillor Simar. Any questions? Well. Under my, if I take a look at the e scribe document that I have before me, there, there, there are no figures with regards to the, the, the schedule. And without comparative months, it's difficult. Though numbers for January and February are being manually entered into our accounting system. And on occasion, Mr. Denoyer seems like a superhero. There are limits, and he wasn't ready to do a three-month uh, report. So I said, let's produce template so you can see what it's going to look like, and next month you'll have the data for the three, maybe four months. Could Mr. Keogh do this? What? <laughs> I'm going. Could Mr. Keogh do this? <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. It's hard for him to do work on the side of the room. <laughs> All those in favor? Carried then, thank you. Well, we, uh, maybe I'd call for a registered vote on this, Mr. Mayor. No, let's forget it. Let's go on now to the next item, awards for purchase and installation of LED street lights. 
minutes. Uh, Councillor Lalonde, yes, Mr. Mayor? Fine. All right. All right. The Committee of the Whole further recommends that uh, Council adopts a bylaw to authorize the execution of a contract with Woman International Corporation for the purchase of LED streetlight installation projects uh, and, and that the Committee of the Whole recommend to enter into a signed contract to oversee installation the installation project, the amount of $197,232, excluding HSD. Mr. Mayor, because we are, uh, we have uh, an economy of scale, really, with regards to this, we don't have to tag this on to what we owe, which is a good, uh, which is good news. Now, during the first year, we changed the lights. During the course of the first year, we changed the lights of the Clarence F Creek Arena, and I'm wondering if it would be not be possible to change lights in our parks. Essentially, we're making use of the same technology, LED, same equipment that's uh, that's made use of with regards to our street lighting, street light project, LEDs. Are we talking about a big amount here? Well. Well, Mr. Mayor, what happens is this. It seems to be the same thing, you know, just the fact of replacing lights. However, there's still a difference, a major difference between street lights and lights in a parking lot or installed in a park. It seems as if we'll be realizing a lot of uh, savings. Uh, however, if we get involved in park or parking lot lights, uh, that's a different matter because those lights need to be looked into or analyzed differently, if you wish, on an individual basis and require more often than not different accessories as opposed to street lights, for example, blinders and things like that. Because of the proximity of adjoining private property. So. Typically, municipalities proceed on a, on a two-tiered basis. They install street lights, and then they look after park lights. Well, now that we've realized the uh, savings, I needed to ask that question. Councillor Lalonde, well, we're dealing with two contracts, one to install those lights and one to purchase those lights, yes. Are we also going to replace those broken posts that are on Laurier Street? Well. Mr. Mayor, uh, this does not deal with the uh, Laurier Street lights. This will be addressed by the Laurier Street revitalization, revitalization project. No street lights will be addressed in this particular project on Laurier Street. If we're talking about lampposts, well, we're dealing here with decorative lights that don't fall under the same constraints as other lights. But those that are not considered as being decorative lights, yes, those that are not considered as decorative lights will be replaced. I have three questions, by the way. Now, when we ask that this be installed, now the company that uh, takes care of replacing existing lights, the Vinkley Kill Basic Company, was it asked to take part in the tender project? Well, all Sproul was invited. Well, we didn't invite anyone specifically. We're dealing with a competitive process that is funneled through Mercs. Might be worthwhile that folks in our area have a chance to have a say in this. Well, the Terraflex uh, company is in our area. Well, I took a look everywhere in the budget, and I see this item recurring in 2019. We needed to deal with it last year. We didn't do anything about it. Uh, well, it seems that this is a capital expenditure project. Well, yes, it will be subject to loans, but still we budget it regardless. Well, this is a project that's deemed a work in pro progress project. It was not presented to Council as a new capital expenditure project. It was not? No. 
all of those projects are considered as work in progress projects. Well, if I'm not mistaken, this has been budgeted for 2019. Well, I believe in two, uh, we worked along with that same amount to do work on the Clarence Creek Arena. The rest of the money left over deals with the project that's before us now. Let's go on now to protective services, monthly report. That's item 9.9. .9. Councillor Levert, I move that report number 2018-009 regards, with regards to st monthly statistics be received as information. He's starting to get tired, Mr. Mayor. Seconded by Councillor Sima. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And hopefully we're we'll yeah, Hopefully, with all the visits you guys make to house, to, to the houses, <coughs> the stats will be uh, for uh, uh, fires and, and stuff like that will go down even more. So. Yes. Other items. Do any of you have any questions to department heads? Councillor Zant. Mr. Lenhart. It seems that we had a water main breakage. It's a water, water break, yes, that's on Garo quite recently. This is a third break in recent years, but none of the citizens had been advised that the water had been shut off. And by the way, I saw a guy with a shovel waiting for things to happen. Maybe this guy with a shovel could knock door to door to let people know that their water has been shut off. In the city of Ottawa, they came up with postcards saying, you know, we apologize that your water has been shut off and please visit the, our website. And people will knock at people's doors and leave this notice at respective uh, homes. We should come up with a means of communication to advise individual ratepayers if their water is cut off. Of course, when a problem have occurs, it does occur. Uh, beyond our, uh, if it's something beyond our control, if it's in the midst of taking a shower or something, let's make sure we have open lines of communication when there's a similar breakage that does occur in the future. Councillor Lalonde, just to comment on the events that we lived through in these past. Uh, two days. I believe that the Sea of Clarence and Rockland's uh, response has been more than adequate. However, we've uh, certainly uh, identified the fact that we have a shelter service that needs to be improved and we need to do a bit, bit more work on the generator that gives power to the shelter. Also, the municipal garage, when I see those guys that go around with small generators to open up the garage doors and to pump in fuel, I think that we have to uh, to uh, invest in tools that will alleviate the situation. Uh, yes, in agreement. Councillor Laval, yes, with regards to the update of the temporary closure of roads, we do state that all roads that have been reopened, Johnson, Rollin, and so on and so forth. And we're dealing also with Bourget and St. Jean Streets and Bourget and Rockland County Road, but we're not talking uh, any about the Joannes Road. Is it, does it remain open or does it remain closed? We're not dealing with Joannes Road at all. We're not alluding to it at all. And it's a county road. Yes, we should come up with a list indeed concerning those county roads that we're taking care of. I've issued a complaint to the United Counties this morning to this effect. I'm wondering, is Joannis Road open or not? It's just to make counties aware of what's open and not. I know that some folks on Facebook uh, wondered if uh, Joannis was open or not, but they can't go all too quickly. They can't move all that quickly. There'll be a special meeting on April 30th called to deal with fire station and the water system that feeds into Limoges. Mm -hmm. Councillor Lalon, my last question, Mr. Mayor. During the previous meeting, I raised the issue about the numerous lights that were burnt out, 10 at least on Main Street, if not more. Now, 
Heritage and Sylvain has burnt out lights, and they've been burnt out for the past three to four months. Mr. Leonard, when do we plan on changing those particular lights? Um, let me see here, Mr. Mayor. Once the project uh, will be approved during the course of the next meeting, from that point on, let's give ourselves five to six weeks, and then uh, the contractors will replace all those new lights that need to be replaced. I know that from Chambellan on, a lot of lights need to be replaced. They will all be replaced. Fine. Thank you. Well, that was quite an answer. Thank you. That's it. Fine. Adjournment called at 1031. That's not too bad.